Good evening. Tonight's webinar is the management of borderline personality disorder in public mental health services, private and primary healthcare sectors. And I would like to begin with an acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of the land and acknowledge um, all the lands across Australia where our webinar presenters and participants are located. And in Melbourne where I'm based, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. We wish to pay respect to the elders past, present and future for the memories, traditions, culture and hopes of Indigenous Australia. My name is Lynn O'Grady and I'll be facilitating this webinar as I have facilitated the previous ones. I'm very pleased to be here. And as always, joined by a fabulous panel who I'll introduce to you in a moment. So if you're not aware of the series, this is the sixth webinar of this National Borderline Personality Disorder Project that's funded by the National Mental Health Commission. And if you haven't attended the first five webinars, and I know that some people haven't because some of the questions that have come through um, would have been covered in those other, other webinars. So I'd like to encourage you to go to the Australian BPD Foundation website and have a look at those other webinars because they'll cover a lot of um, interesting information for you. In my day job I work at the Australian Psychological Society managing a strategic project so I also supervise some interns. So this series has been of, of great interest to me as well. As always, we, ha we have a panel and we have a lot of you at, at home. We over have over 650 people now joining us and we know that there are a lot of people who um, will be joining us with their own um, experiences as well. So wanting to just, I guess, remind people to look after your own self-care. And I say this at the start of every one of the, our webinars, but we're really mindful of, of the need for us to um, have, have good self-care for ourselves and just to flag that at the start of the webinar. So of course, if there's any any distress or concerns that you're feeling for you to, to plan for what you might um, do to look after yourself. And of course Beyond Blue phone number 1300 22 4636. Um, but you, you may well have your own plans of, of what you need to do and, and how you will take good care of yourself. You can always uh, watch this webinar tonight or you can stop and, and pause and come back to it or you, you get a recording later on. So you can always watch as far as you'd like to and then, and then join us um, for a, a podcast later on when you get the recording. And of course the suicide callback service is 1300 659 467 just so that you just a prompt to have those those numbers there. So here's our panel for this evening and this is again another really interesting group of people I think. Um, and you would have seen their bios, they were disseminated with the webinar invitation. So we won't go over those again but I will introduce each person one by one. So let's begin with you Kerri Ann. Kerri Ann Chapman is here as our lived experience advocate. And I've got to welcome to you Kerri Ann and I've got a question for you. What's something you want people to know about recovery? Thank you Lynn. Um, the one thing I would want people to know about recovery from BPD is that it's always possible with the right treatment and right support. Right. Thank you. A really important message up front. And this is this series, series we've always had lived experience um, person advocate with us and people have really appreciated it. So I know people are going to be really looking forward to what you've got to share with us tonight and we really appreciate you, you being here. Gillian, Dr. Gillian Singleton is a general practitioner. Hi Gillian, welcome. Hi. The sun's starting to set where you are now. The sun before it was um, very bright and the sun's starting to go down a little bit. We were graced with Gillian's cat early on, so I think everybody should watch out for when Gillian's speaking to see whether there's a little black cat that appears again. Or you may have locked it out by now. So let's ask you an introductory question. As a GP, why did you become interested in borderline personality disorder? Sure, Lynn, I've always had an interest in, in mental health and it's what I, what I really love about general practice is you get a holistic overview of all your patients. And a number of years ago, I got completely burnt out. And I, when I looked back at my patient list as to who I was going to hand over and I decided to take some time off, two thirds of my patients actually had um, either a borderline diagnosis or borderline trait. And that really, it was an aha moment for me and it really made me realise the importance of self-care and actually having some strategies to look after myself so I could be there for my patients. That's what I'm passionate about. Nice, okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, that story with us. And we look forward to hearing from you as well. Let's move Thanks. on to you now, Paul. So Dr. Paul Kamel, no, I'm not sure if I've said your surname right. I should have checked that earlier on, but hopefully that's okay. Paul's joining us, he's a psychiatrist. And I've got a question for you as well, Paul. What role do you play as a psychiatrist when working with people who have borderline personality disorder? So just a, a little question to get started. A little 
bit hard to hear you, Paul. You're cutting in and out. I'm not sure if Red Bath are able to help us with that. Maybe start Is that again. better? Can you hear me now? Yeah, heaps better. That's much better. Okay, so I've just adjusted my microphone. Okay. I was just saying that I, I work in uh, public and private practice. I work in a large hospital, Royal Melbourne Hospital, in emergency mental health and inpatient work as well as in a private clinic. So I, I can see these kinds of conditions in both of those sectors and, and I think there's a lot of messages we can get across about how to work as a psychiatrist in, in the field. Right, thank you. So you're perfectly placed for tonight's tricky questions around navigating both of those systems if you're in both. Yeah, so those hard questions it. can come to you. So thank you and yep, sounding much better now. Sorry you have to repeat Good. yourself. Let's move on to our last panellist for this evening. Certainly not um, maybe our last, not the least, but um, last for the moment. Professor Bryn Grainer. Grainer? I'm having trouble with surnames tonight. Grenya, psychologist. Sorry, Bryn. What's your involvement in public mental health services treating borderline personality disorder patients? Yes, uh, thanks, Lynn, and welcome, everyone. Look, uh, about 20 years ago, we started a collaborative training program um, and uh, to treat really borderline personality disorder as a collaboration with our um, mental health uh, partners and really have developed that training program and that um, uh, treatment that um, we've developed um, in a lot of different uh, public mental health services. So it's a real pleasure to be here this, this evening. Right. Thank you very much. And it's been a long, long time that we're drawing on. So 20 years is a long time to be doing that work. So thank you. Thank you very much. So as you can see, we have a fabulous panel. And I think you're going to see the, the um, types of discussion that we're going to be having and the information that they're going to be sharing with us. We have over 750 people joining us now, so we're just moving, moving right along. We've got lots of people who'll be, who'll be continuing to join us as we go, go forward. Given that this is our last in the series, we're wanting to, I guess, help people who've been joining us for quite some while who might be having some withdrawals after this one to know that there are other opportunities for you to network. So there are seven practitioner networks that provide a, a forum for practitioners with a shared interest in borderline personality disorder. So you can go to the MHPN org.au news section or contact MHPN to learn more about those those networks. So we want you to continue this learning. We we know that this is um, something people are very interested in, and we want to we want to continue to support you with that. So we encourage you to do that. And let's have a have a bit of a look at our our ground rules. And people who join us will will be very familiar with these, of course. So we we will have um, an opportunity for you to ask some questions and comments. We don't have the live chat that you might be familiar with because we just have so many people. It's too difficult for us to manage. So you can ask us questions and comments, and we really encourage you to do that. And I'll remind you to do that as well. And when you're asking those questions, comments, of course, just be respectful of other participants and panelists. It's a professional development event, so of course we we can only look at professional development um, type questions or comments. We have a case study that we give you so that we've got something to focus on and behave as you would in a face-to-face -face activity. Um, we're well supported, as you know, by um, technical support, the people from Redback as well as people behind the scenes from MHPN as well who, who are there to support you. So if you have any technical issues, you can um, refer to the technical support frequently asked questions tab at the top of the screen. Or if you still need further support from that, there's a help desk phone number there that you can you can ring and, and get some um, immediate help with, with people. And if there's any major issues, there'll be an announcement. But we um, we hope that won't happen. At the end of the webinar, we will get, um, have a feedback form for you. And we really would like you to fill that form out. We find it very, very helpful. We do report on, on the, each webinar and on the series, so we really value the, the support and the information that we can get from the feedback form and obviously reporting to funding bodies is also really very important. So please take a few minutes at the end to, to do that. All right, let's move on to our learning outcomes for tonight. So you would have seen these when you registered as well. So through an exploration of borderline personality disorder, the webinar will provide participants with the opportunity to do these three things. Identify challenges in the management of borderline personality disorder in public, private and primary sectors. Describe how borderline personality disorder is best managed in public, private and primary care settings. And outline how best to collaborate between public, private and primary care settings to get optimal treatment outcomes for people with borderline personality disorder and their families and carers. 
So I just want to remind you of the case study. Hopefully you've had a chance to read it, but just in case you, you haven't or you've forgotten, um, I'll just do a brief, as I can, recap so that we're all familiar with what we're talking about and just to set the scene so that then we can move on to Kerri ann and, and hear what she has to say about it. So the case study is a fictional case study that's been made up by the group about Tina. And Tina is a 30-year-old woman. She's a single mother of a five-year-old child called Joshua. And she lives with her mother, Jane. Tina is unemployed. She's on a disability pension. She meets criteria for borderline personality diagnosis, uh, frequently overdoses on medication, flicks cuts on her limbs, has a hospital emergency department attendances, which then lead to an ongoing cycle of, of crisis own symptoms, has a history of violent relationships, very few friends, and has an angry outbursts with, with Jane, her mother. <coughs> and she also has disordered eating since um, 16 years of age. And the situation we've put ourselves in to talk about tonight is that three days ago she was admitted to a local public hospital. She's been case managed by a local mental health service and they've advised that she'll be discharged shortly. Um, so the case management um, have also advised that she's that's about the thief. So she's been referred back to the GP and she's very lucky she's known the um, GP since she was 15 years of age. And uh, Jane, her mother, is, is worried about this and wants a private psychiatrist involved but Tina has no private health insurance. So you can see already the systems are at work and, and getting involved there. So that's what we're going to be exploring this evening. So without any further ado, I think we should hand over to you, Kerry ann Let's hear what your thoughts are about this case study. Thank you, Lynn. I want to acknowledge the individuals who have a lived experience of borderline personality disorder and their carers who support them through this difficult journey as well as the clinicians who provide individual and group support to consumers on their healing journey. In this case study, it's important to remember that Tina is first and foremost a human being, and she is someone who has a lived experience of borderline personality disorder as a secondary statement. Consumers are not their diagnosis. They are individuals who have experienced significant pain and distress and need to be treated with humanity and compassion. When given the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, it can be very confronting for consumers and their carers due to the high level of stigma around this diagnosis that still exists today. As a clinician, supporting someone through their diagnosis, it's essential to promote hope and self-empowerment with that individual. This can be through sharing success stories of consumers who are in recovery and doing well that you have supported previously. By doing this, you're showing that recovery is possible and also that you have belief in the person you are supporting that they too can recover. It can be really difficult to find clinical support that best works for the consumer's recovery and it can take a lot of time. Don't be afraid to see a few clinicians before making a decision about which clinician you'd like to continue seeing. Another challenge with accessing support is that you can be on a very long waiting list, which can cause distress and uncertainty. During this period, it's important to find strategies and supports that can alleviate some of this stress and to keep the consumer safe. Um, at many points, this somehow happens to be the GP when someone's waiting to get uh, an appointment with a clinician, they go back to their GP to find that support. Other challenges that consumers face when accessing support in the public sector are long waiting lists for DBT group therapy or short DBT group therapy programs, and the fact that long short-term group therapy programs do not provide long-term care, so it might not be as the right fit for that consumer. There's also misdiagnosis and disrupted continu continuity of care through seeing different clinicians with short appointment times. In the private sector, challenges that consumers face are very expensive out-of-pocket costs for private treatment and increasing annual health insurance premiums, long waiting lists for DBT group therapy, and also the difficulty of finding a DBT specialist who does not have their book shut. Slide, please. 
When a consumer is engaged with several different service providers, oftentimes information is not shared openly with all parties involved in the consumer's treatment, which can impact significantly on the consumer's recovery, as not everyone is on the same page. When a consumer has been provided a case manager, like in this scenario, it's important to provide regular updates to the case manager with the consumer's consent so that there is a continuity of care and the best outcomes of recovery for the consumer. Feedback mechanisms need to be established so that the dialogue remains open and wellness plans need to be consistent throughout each service that the consumer is accessing. These wellness plans need to be living documents that are flexible and grow and change as the consumer does at different points in their recovery and it must be led by the consumer. A positive aspect of accessing the public system as a consumer with BPD is that you may be eligible to access peer support in inpatient treatment facilities and while transitioning to community care settings. This support can be invaluable as it's built on mutual understanding, shared experience and role models recovery to the consumer. It also assists the consumer with reducing their likelihood of readmission in that critical 28 day period after being discharged from hospital. A peer support worker can purposefully share their story of recovery which promotes hope and self-determination and regardless of whether a consumer is accessing public, private or primary care support, it is best practice to give the consumer options for their treatment. Allow them to make decisions by giving them information to make informed choices and the choice that is best for them. Involve their carers into planning wherever possible with the consumer's consent to do so. Ensure consumers are able to complete wellness plans in each service that they are accessing where their needs and preferences are identified so that the if the consumer becomes unwell, there is a plan for what support they'd like to access and who they would like to be notified at that time. Goals need to be collaborative between the clinician and the consumer and the consumer needs to lead their own recovery with autonomy. I'll pass it back to you now, Lynn. Great. Thanks very much, Terry ann There's so much information there. I'm sure people are already thinking we're covering lots of ground and we could pick up on a lot of those points. And I, I know there's some of the things that people started asking questions about already. So thank you very much and we'll return to some of those later on. Just a reminder too, if you do have any questions or comments, please pop them in, in the appropriate place and, and we'll get to those as, as we go through. So we want to have them um, streaming through. As we, as we go through tonight's session. If there's a particular issue you'd like one of the presenters to talk a little bit more about, you can, you can prompt us to ask that person. So let's move on to you now, Gillian, and let's hear your perspective from a general practitioner. Thanks so much, Lynn. So my aim now in general practice is not to end up looking like the guy on the left at the end of the day. And so as I, just, as I mentioned before, self-care and self-reflection is so incredibly important, I think. There are lots of challenges faced by GPs in both identifying and giving consistent management to these vulnerable individuals with a BPD diagnosis. Um, you're probably already aware that it is incredibly common in general practice that 5% of individuals presenting to primary care actually meet criteria for BPD and, and sadly many of those are not recognised. Um, due to the presence of comorbidity, we know about 94% of um, these individuals have significant other comorbidities, often, often other mental health diagnoses, which cover up the BPD diagnosis, which prevents people from accessing the care that they need. And I'm wondering if this is what's been happening to, to Tina. So we know that based on those stats, every GP in Australia has between five and 27 patients with BPD. And so I'm really passionate about educating GPs about um, the fact that it's really important that we play a management role, particularly in individuals at the less severe end of the spectrum. So the people at the more severe end can access the specialised services. So there's a lot we can do as GPs to um, just using simple basic strategies and Kerry ann mentioned a few of those before, just being consistent and being there, having boundaries, having a safe therapeutic environment that individuals like Tina can come to on a regular basis. 
we all know that there's a lot of stigma and discrimination associated with DPD, and I'm, and I'm wondering when Tina's diagnosis was made, I'm wondering if it was picked up when she was in adolescent with her GP or whether it's, it's come much later, because we know that early interventions make a big difference. And I think GPs are incredibly well placed to intervene early and provide really good psychoeducation and simple strategies to support people until they, they may need to access more specialised services. So um, in, in this particular case, we have a duty of care, obviously, to, to Tina, but also to Joshua and Jane. And I've got lots of questions. Jane doesn't sound like she's getting any support. And so for me, as a GP of the family, I'd be wanting to make sure that she's linked in with some really good support networks and gets access to the information she needs so she can be there for Tina. And Joshua, so is he at risk? Certainly with Tina's um, history of tumultuous relationships, exposure to um, intimate partner violence. I'm, I'm concerned that he might be at risk. And also how Tina's going with her parenting. So looking at whether she needs some support around that in Victoria, whether we need to refer her to child first or another service that can give her some extra help. In terms of risk reduction, obviously there's lots of complexity in, in Tina's case. Being a type 1 diabetic with an eating disorder, that's huge in itself and puts her at significant risk, both of, of overdose and certainly of developing complications because her control isn't good. I'm concerned about her medications. At least, um, does she need to be on Seroquel? I'll be talking to her psychiatrist about that and wanting to make sure that we had a clear plan. Now, moving on to um, the importance of boundaries in general practice, and it's an easy word to say, but really hard to implement in, um, in an individual like Tina. Mm. There are some significant physical health issues that, that need to be managed. And so saying, I can only see you every fortnight, you know, that, that I don't think that will work with her because she has other needs. And so developing a, a really good um, long-term contract and management plan with Tina around shared decision-making and helping both of us together working as a team with the other professionals to come up with who's doing what and what can we do to support her best to be both physically and psychologically and socially well. As I, as I was just said, um, having a holistic approach is incredibly important. And we all know that some individuals on disability support pensions, it's difficult for them to access the specialised care that they need. Ten psychological sessions a year is not enough, but it's nowhere near enough for most individuals with BPD. And so um, it would be wonderful if you could link in the specialised services, but not all of the patients that I see in my practice just can't afford it until they get so unwell that they, they need to be admitted to a public unit or access case management through the community mental health. And focusing on collaboration being absolutely essential. So working as a, as a team with Tina at the centre of that team and involving Jane and Joshua, her psychologist and her psychiatrist, communicating regularly, figuring out who's doing what and clearly defining those responsibilities. In my last 20 seconds, I just wanted to, to touch on self-care. As I mentioned before, it's so incredibly important. As GPs, we're not good at debriefing. We're not good about at talking about what, what, how we're going. And so it's incredibly important to recognise compassion fatigue and burnout and vicarious trauma in ourselves and in our colleagues. And to develop some structures around boundary and time management, about debriefing regularly, about maybe joining a bailing group, finding what works for you to ensure that you're in a, a, a good space to provide a safe therapeutic environment for your patients. Thanks, Lynn. Great, thanks Gillian. And I could see you really trying to get through all that information in, in the time frame. So thank you for that. And I, I think the message around self-care is, is a really important one and, and I'm sure applies to DPs but also other um, mental health professionals as well. And the quote there, if your compassion does not include yourself, it is incomplete. So that's a really um, important message as well. So, so thank you very much and we'll come thanks, back with questions. I can see a few questions starting to, to come through now, which is great. So keep them coming. Um, keeping an eye on them. So, so thank you. Let's now move on to who we have next, Bryn. Now, Bryn is a one slide man, which is very impressive. So over to you now, Bryn, to take us through all of the information you're going to share with us. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. Look, I think this case is a very um, important case in that it uh, highlights, I think, a number of critical issues we need to be thinking about. And to me, the major issue here is how do we manage transitions a lot better? Uh, Kerry Ann's already talked about the problem of long waiting lists, and it is a significant risk for people with personality disorder. But also, it's a risk for the way the health service um, understands and, and works with uh, the person who's seeking care. 
ultimately uh, we need to have a compassionate approach and I'm sure that everyone understands that you know compassion means that we don't necessarily always have to understand or agree with everything that's going on around us but at least we can try and um, put ourselves in the shoes of the person and try and understand and have compassion towards the struggles that they have and the, one of the best ways of doing that really is also to be thinking about you know being human ourselves and that all of us at any time you know can get emotionally dysregulated and can have uh, challenges and I'm sure all of us um, at some stage in our lives have had um, struggles um, and understanding that um, in many ways um, people with BPD are asking for help when they are in crisis they uh, expect a human and compassionate response and really um, are asking for somebody to um, talk to them about what's going on for them and ask questions about what's going on. We know that um, psychological treatment is the treatment of choice for BPD um, and so in many ways we need to work out well what's the best way of actually us all being able to communicate in a much more effective and helpful way that uh, really um, bridges that gap now Tina's in a very difficult situation. She's just been admitted. Um, and the problem that she has, of course, is that um, she keeps getting into a cycle of um, readmission to emergency departments. And so one of the big challenges there is really multidisciplinary communication and how do we um, all uh, make sure that we understand each other and uh, are on the same page. Considerations on the inpatient ward, um, we know in the here and now that very much Tina will want to be connected with us um, and she'll want to know what's going on so we need to communicate clearly and give her clear expectations about what's going to go on and also to be um, expecting that um, uh, discharge from hospital can be challenging for people with BPD. It can activate abandonment anxiety, it can make them feel very uncertain about whether they're going to get the help that they're asking for and therefore we really do need to have some kind of stepped care or rapid access to psychological care uh, that really does provide um, a way of making sure that there is a good transition to uh, psychological care after an acute presentation. The problem of course with Tina at the moment is that's not in place and um, I think all health services need to think very carefully about um, uh, the opportunities for building more stepped care uh, programs. I think the other issue for uh, Tina here really is also that um, she has a five-year-old son. Uh, when she's in hospital uh, there's issues there around his care um, and it really brings in a whole bunch of issues I suppose around Tina's mum, Jane, um, and what family and carer support is she getting at the moment. Um, she um, doesn't seem to be getting any support so nobody's talking to Jane about um, Tina's struggles or about the diagnosis or about some of the really good family skills and psychoeducation programs that are available. And similarly Joshua, um, you know there are definitely some parenting kind of strategies that we could be working uh, with Tina around to protect him to make sure that he's well looked after when she gets unwell and uh, some additional parenting skills. I think also in terms of discharge, the first 30 days are very important. Um, Kerry Ann's already talked about you know, a really important role for peer support workers. Uh, we also uh, in New South Wales are developing these transitional clinics uh, or called Gold Card Clinic or Stepped Care Clinics to really ensure that there's rapid follow-up uh, when people are discharged. And um, there's really, I think, opportunities for health services to think a lot more about what happens in those first 30 days because really that is a high risk period and people do want to be able to talk about and get the skills that we know um, are based on evidence. I think evidence-based therapy for Tina is always the primary goal. Uh, obviously, we've talked a lot about the challenges in ac accessing that. Um, uh, we do need to build more uh, evidence-based programs um, across uh, Australia um, and also we need to be wise in the way we use that. So um, 
people do need to have access to stepped care where they can get help rapidly when they need it um, and also to be able to have opportunities for longer term uh, programs that uh, we know are going to be effective. So there are some of the kinds of considerations I think we need to be thinking about in terms of working with Tina. Mm -hmm. It really is multidisciplinary and it really is a, a, an opportunity for us to think more broadly, not only about her, but also family support um, and carer support for her mum and also be very mindful of Joshua as well. Thank you, Great, thanks. thanks very much, Bryn. You covered a lot there and you're picking up on some of the comments that are coming around around um, sense of abandonment and you did touch on that in terms of that, that, that follow up and that need to recognise that and acknowledge that and, and follow up carefully. So we might pick up on that again a bit later on and also the evidence based treatment is something we've talked about in previous webinars. So if people haven't seen those and are wondering what are those treatments, we're not going to have time to talk about the treatments themselves tonight, we're talking more around the systems and the processes between systems but we do have webinars and information that's available on those evidence based treatments and I, I think a lot of um, messages in the past have been around the sorts of things we've been talking about around the family and um, the, the hopefulness I guess in terms of treatments, there are treatments there that can be, can be um, working for people. So, Look out for the other webinars to find out some more about that. So thanks, Bryn. You covered lots of ground there. Now let's move on to you, Paul. You've been patiently waiting for us. So let's move on and, and hear your perspective from the psychiatrist. Very good. Thank you very much, Lynn. Uh, so I've, I've really appreciated all the contributions of uh, the other speakers so far and I think I can build a lot on potentially what they've already had to say. I think uh, I really liked what Carrie ann had to say about really, uh, I suppose, being person-centred in your approach, not thinking about a diagnosis and, and the importance also of information sharing, sharing and being collaborative. And I also was very impressed by what Gillian had to say about her comprehensive, comprehensive and thoughtful approach as a general practitioner to how she would work with an individual like Tina and then I think uh, Bryn covered very uh, thoughtfully and comprehensively how health systems need to engage and think very carefully about these transitions and to be collaborative and compassionate and to communicate very well. And so when I, I work as a psychiatrist uh, and if there's a sense that someone like Tina needs some kind of specialist involvement, a psychiatrist involved or specialist therapy, often the most important thing to do, building on what Carrie ann uh, the saying was first just to meet the individual and see where they're at currently and see what their needs and expectations are and what they'd like. So really that's the, the basis of, of building some kind of therapeutic alliance or therapeutic rapport initially. You're seeing the person, engaging with them and seeing what they want before you start to think about all of these complexities behind that. Uh, so see what Tina wants and then of course there is a lot that a psychiatrist can offer just simply initially by assessing and coordinating, so building on what um, Gillian was talking about, there's already someone, I'm, I'm new to the scene and I'm just seeing Tina for the first time but I know since Tina, she's 30 now, since she was 16 she's had a, a very involved general practitioner so we'd be collaborating on all of these complex issues around her, uh, her diabetes and insulin use and, and issues with her, her mother and, uh, and son that she lives with and um, all of her engagement with um, other services in the past and in the present and, and issues managing her eating disorder uh, that's been very significant in the past and is still active. So there's all of those things to initially engage with and of course stakeholder engagement is really important. So seeing what Tina's um, needs and expectations are in terms of working with um, her mother as a, a support and also seeing how she's coping with the, the parenting role and all of those kind of things. So all of that engagement in, in communication and involvement occurring right at the beginning as a psychiatrist or then begin to think about what kinds of specialist uh, psychotherapies can be made available. They could be something I could potentially offer um, with my training and interest or I can be someone who's almost like an advocate. Uh, someone that can help Tina troubleshoot how she accesses other supports and services and therapies and I can play a almost like a case coordinator type role overseeing those kinds of issues as well as 
related issues like uh, the, the medication treatment uh, that she's been on assessing the, the role of, of medication if there is any and um, what benefit that's had and how she's going with all of the other supports so coordinating the supports because really we can see that uh, Bettina to this point there's been lots of different uh, services and, and supports involved and there can be the feeling a bit like Bryn was saying that there's um, issues of abandonment that might be activated or a sense that there's chaos and a lack of coordination and really a psychiatrist's role can be to communicate and liaise and try to, in terms of thinking about the principles of good care for personality disorder, getting the different uh, services and then the different people involved uh, involved in some kind of cohesive and containing system of support around Tina. But as I said, that begins with having a conversation with Tina about where she's at and um, and what she wants before we start to, to build on that. So I think that's what uh, a key role that a psychiatrist can play in this kind of case. Not everyone can, a bit like Carrie Anza, can readily access a, a psychiatrist. Sometimes there's a wait and sometimes there's a lot of open expectation built on, on that initial um, encounter with the psychiatrist. So the psychiatrist has to be very flexible and, and adaptive to the situation and think about the different kinds of things um, he or she can offer uh, someone like Tina and offer all of the people around uh, Tina who uh, might be very concerned about how she's progressing. Um, so hopefully that conveys some of what a psychiatrist in this kind of real and practical situation would have to offer. Uh, Lynn? Okay, great. Thanks, Paul. I think one of the things that was important from what you said was that um, you are working together, but you also have distinct roles. So, what is it that you could do that that a psychologist might not do, or the DP might not do? So, I think that's that's really important, and and also for each of the workers, but also for the clients, to see that there there are distinct roles that people are playing. So, thank you very much for that. Did you want to talk about this one, this slide at all, before I move past it? I think that was just really for the the audience. Uh, some of the content there to look at afterwards. Yeah. Just terms of some of the ideal models of care that we need to try to apply into these real world settings. Right, okay, there's lots there isn't there and I guess mm. people starting to think where do I fit in this, where am I in this mm. space and what can I what can I continue to do. We can come back to that if, um, if some of the questions lead us to that. So let's get on to our, our Q&A session because I know people are asking some questions already which is great. Um, one of them that I thought is perhaps useful to, to start off with, and this could be a question for anyone to answer, Anne asks us, as a mental health tri triage clinician, I find that many services and professionals refer to acute mental health and emergency departments in a fear reaction to risk when de-escalation, support and reassurance may be more appropriate. So any comments on how we might be able to educate regarding managing and de-escalating risk and understanding why it is there in that moment. Now, I've tried to read that slowly enough. Hopefully you've captured that. So it's, it's really the, the, uh, the professional being able to manage their own fears and worries when, when things are escalating for the client. Would anyone like to kick us off in, with an answer to that one? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to say a few words on that then. Right, thanks, Bryn. Yeah, look, I think, I think it's a very important um, clinical question in treating BPD is to differentiate between acute risk and chronic risk. Uh, it's true that uh, people uh, in early in their journey, their recovery journey with BPD often feel um, quite um, helpless and hopeless and can have suicidal thoughts um, and, uh, and yet at the same time may have um, effective factors around that. But there's never ever a, a time when a person can be considered to be completely um, not at risk. And I think uh, it's very important as a clinician to differentiate between acute risk when a person has a sudden change in their mood um, and uh, becomes uh, much more risky uh, because of some kind of breakdown in their relationship uh, from, a, um, I suppose, what we might call chronic risk where Actually, we can do very good work in the community and keep people safe if we ensure that they get the treatment that they need and the psychological care. So just in a, you know, in a sense, to be effective with BPD, we have to tolerate some degree of risk uh, in order to uh, be able to make sure people get evidence-based therapy. Okay. Great, thanks, Bryn. 
so we have to tolerate some of some degree of risk and, and I guess be supported in, in that as practitioners. So that's important. Anyone else like to comment on, on that? Yes, I can see that people do. So Paul, over to you. What would you add to that? Yeah, just build, build, building on what Bryn had to say, I think that anyone working in this space has to tolerate uh, risk, a bit like Bryn was saying, and I think it always becomes a collaborative point with the individual that's expressing a sense of uh, lack of safety or suicidal thoughts or impulses or a sense of loss of control to actually enter into dialogue with them about that and frequently I suppose we've got the question from someone that works on a triage line sometimes someone living with uh, personality disorder might describe really mixed responses they get from someone on a triage line at one moment there uh, it feels like it's dismissive or minimising of their problems are told to just um, self-soothe or have a warm bath when they feel a lot more say, un unsafe than that. At other times they, they might feel the, um, the triage person escalates things too rapidly and might call an ambulance on them and they just needed to talk for 15 minutes and, and they help themselves get control of the situation. So I think um, the thing to learn is that a you know, person might have an acute sense of risk and just engage in that kind of therapeutic conversation where you can Help, um, help them come to terms with their sense of loss of control or lack of safety and, and, um, and kind of straddle those two polar kind of opposites, the sense that the person you know, is really in acute danger and needs to go straight to hospital or there's nothing much wrong with them at all. You need to kind of empathise and validate and help the person work through what they're dealing with and that's often the most important thing. Right. Okay, thank you. And I guess some of that conversation happening when the person is, is not in that um, distress state as well, so they've got a bit of a plan mm. agreement mm. beforehand, so that this is kind of part of what might happen. So planning for that. Mm. Okay, mm. thank you. That's great. And Gillian, you'd like to add something as well? Yes, yeah, just adding to what you just mentioned, Gillian, that I think GPs can play a really important role. Often we do have the long view of patients over over time, and when we see people between crises when they're doing okay. It's really important to develop those crisis plans with the other professionals on the team and the individual at the centre obviously. Um, so if this happens what should we do and coming up with the strategies which to cope that the individual has helped you develop I think that can be really useful and I think a lot of GPs are quite scared and mm -hmm. don't feel that they have the, the skills and I just encourage GPs out there to this is a really important area to develop confidence and develop skills and as you said it is so common and so I think we all need to have those skills to, to provide these individuals with the, the best quality care that they can access. Right. Okay, thank you. So pretty comprehensive answers to that to that question. We did have a webinar, I feel like I'm just like this walking advert really because we did have a webinar that did look at self-harm and, and suicide because it is something that um, that comes up with people um, with borderline personality disorder. So look back to the previous webinar and, and that might give you a bit more information as well. Now let's um, have a look at some of the other questions that are coming through as well. Um, the question around abandonment has come, come up quite a bit and, and I think the case study got us thinking about that in terms of um, being discharged and then the case management plan um, not sort of happening and then where's the person going to be left. So would anyone like to comment a little bit more on, on this question around all this sort of issue of abandonment, a sense of abandonment or a sense of being rejected? Would anyone like to comment in that in terms of what can we do as individuals all together? So how can systems maybe recognise that this can be something that, that we might be able to, to understand better and, and do some, some work on? Would anyone like to comment on that one? Well, then I can say something again. Thanks, Bryn. I can always rely on you, I'm noticing, <laughs> to get us well, started look, at least. I think, I think it's important to understand uh, one of the core uh, criteria of BPD is a real difficulty with relationships, which can include an intense sensitivity, attachment neediness, attachment fears around trust and suspiciousness and so forth. And that really does require the mental health clinician and also family members and carers to recognise that actually people with BPD want to stay connected. They actually need people to feel, they need to feel like people are around and that they are being held in somebody's mind. They can often have a great sense of emptiness and um, 
And that can mean that um, actually what they're reaching out for is connection. And um, and so obviously, you know, in the case of Tina, when um, when she has been transitioned from service to service, um, we need to be thinking very carefully about how can we make sure that she understands what's going on, that we talk to her about that, and we we open the opportunity to stay connected, and uh, to ensure that um, uh, her mother Jane and so forth are well connected also with what's going on, because they are often, you know, the most important people in in their lives. And so, if we can help Jane as the the mother of Tina to to um, understand the nature of that kind of attachment um, neediness and abandonment anxiety, then that can really help Jane to understand some of Tina's needs. Great, thanks, Bryn. Anyone else like to jump in to add anything to that or other thoughts about that? Or we can move on. Moving on, I think. Okay, so there's a question specifically for you, Gillian, and is Julie has asked, what is a Balint group? Now, I'm, I don't actually remember you saying that, but did you mention a particular group? Of Balint group. Balint. <laughs> um, structure, <laughs> they would, <you> know. <laughs> um, structure groups where any health professional can get together and, and talk through complex cases and their reactions to those cases and talking about transference and counter-transference. It's just a, a structure, a deeply thing that's, uh, yep. Yeah. It's a particular okay. form of structure. Yep. Okay. And where would people find out about that? Is it? Oh my goodness. Of... There is a website. Can I get okay. back to you on that one? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We can add a website, or people could maybe Google and see what they can yeah. what they can I'll find come as back. well. I'll come okay. Back before the end of the webinar. With All you. right. Fantastic. And I've just heard that MHPN actually has these groups. And I'm not going to say the word because I'm sure I'll pronounce it wrong again. So MHPN has some that you might have a website for us as well before the end, so people can stay tuned for that. I've got a question around um, limited services in rural areas. So I don't know if anyone, this is always a difficult question and we always have this as one of the questions that come up in any MHPN webinar that I facilitate. Would anyone like to have a, have a go at, at what do we do in rural areas when perhaps the systems that we're talking about aren't able to connect up as well or there, there are perhaps some gaps? Would anyone, and, and Kerri ann I, I know that um, we haven't heard from you for a little while. I don't know if you'd like to answer that question or any any comment on any other um, things that we've been talking about. I'll give you a chance to to tell us what you're thinking. Um, I'm not from a rural area, but when I was accessing DBT Group DBT, there was only one hospital in my local area or in the hour and a half in which I live that accessed DBT. So that was quite challenging for me. Um, the biggest challenge I experienced was being on the waiting list for seven months and never knowing when I was going to start. So that was um, quite difficult for my family to manage. Um, but we had plans week to week about how I was going to get through it. Um, I had an appointment with my GP every four days. I was seeing an interim psychologist at that time and we had skills that I could start building around distress tolerance and self-care which enormously helped me um, in terms of waiting to access that treatment. Wow, so really comprehensive plan and support around that while you're waiting because it's a really long time, isn't it? It is, yes, especially when you don't know how long you're going to be waiting for. It seems even longer. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't have to be rural areas for that for that to happen either, which is um, always concerning. Anyone like to comment on the rural question though? Anyone got particular perspectives on that or knows of anything that's kind of working well in rural areas? I can say a few words on that if you like, Lynn. Yeah, thanks, Bryn. Look, I think the issue for us really in terms of um, rural care is how important the GP becomes. Because and also not only the GP but also I guess those really core um, community uh, based services um, and the communication between them, the GP, and sometimes also the school uh, can be the center of a community. And really, we need to um, think very carefully about uh, communication again and relationships, and to be be prepared to adapt evidence based therapies. Like it can be very difficult to run groups but you can do lots of good work uh, individually as well. 
So certainly um, the work that we've done with Project AIR um, in terms of uh, our work with regional and rural areas has certainly um, looked at the way we can try and build together a treatment team um, and often the GP is very important with that. Okay, so GP stands out again. So let's hear from you Gillian and you've you know, worked in a rural area so you've got something to add but it certainly sounds like the GP is often the linchpin for this when other things are being put in place, the GP's there. Yeah, I just, um, I mean, Bryn's actually covered most of the, the issues that I was going to cover. But I worked in a rural area for six years and certainly um, I think access to the, the right kind of mental health services is a problem across the country, but um, as kerri and Bryn were saying, it is exacerbated in rural areas and the GPs do need to, to carry a lot more of the, I could call it low, that's not really the right word. Um, and so the importance of accessing those amazing resources throughout like Project AIR that Bryn's been involved in, um, that the, the resources that practitioners can access now compared to 10 years ago are so much better that the importance of collaboration is emphasised. And the importance of, as I was saying before, just using those simple strategies, so providing that consistency over time and as Carrie ann mentioned as well, those regular visits with the GP in that safe space having those clear boundaries and just doing some simple work can actually be really effective for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. And I, I think one of the things we've been covering in some of the other webinars as well is that people can, you don't have to have entirely specialist skills and knowledge. Some of the some of the things that, that people can do can be part of what they might do anyway. So that's something that we have talked about in previous webinars as well. So that's something that is useful to bear in mind, I guess, for people to feel confident in doing this work. Now, Paul, I think you had something to add, but I think that was a little while ago. People may have, yep. may have covered the ground, but anything else around the rural issue? I think it was largely covered by Bryn and Gillian, but just really emphasising that um, um, community health centres, community mental health centres and GPs rurally can innovate locally and, and, and access training um, from places like Project Air and, and Spectrum and um, come up with their own individual and group programs and, and also that uh, there are a range of psychiatrists that can offer remote input, either case consultation, supervision or um, through video conferencing platforms. There are Medicare mm -hmm. items for psychotherapy to be available remotely and the, the RANZCP college website um, where you can search for psychiatrists, you can find which ones offer those kinds of our services. Yeah, great, okay, that's really helpful I think. All right, I've got some questions that came in a bit earlier that I think we might go back to and I think this is something that everyone will have something to say about and this one is around the importance of discharge care planning and follow-up. So we'd like to, uh, Terry ann perhaps let's begin with you in terms of this the idea of being discharged from hospital and the follow-up that we, we've talked about a little bit. But would you have anything to say about that in terms of the importance of it or what can set that up or what it's like for people to have that, to know that that's coming? Have you got any thoughts about that? Uh, usually in acute settings, this is extremely last minute, right before someone is about to leave the unit and no meaningful plans are made to make sure that they remain safe once they leave hospital. So it's important to have these discussions usually at least 48 hours before the individual is going to be discharged. Um, in terms of discharge planning, you need to make sure that you're having these conversations with the consumer and if they have any family involved and want that family involved to ensure that they're part of those discussions as well. I'd say that um, it has to be meaningful so that the consumer feels that they can stay well outside and that they have a good plan in place to make sure that should something happen, they know what they can do. Right, okay, thank you. So Kerri ann has, has really set that up that this is something we need to do better, I guess, is that first message. So would any of the other panellists like to comment on that or, or talk about what, what we could do in terms of doing this better what, or what gets in the way of us doing better? Just to think about. I could add something there, potentially. I think uh, I I'd agree with everything Carrie Ann's had to say, which is often the the whole point of um, if it's a brief hospitalisation, and often it's felt to be limited or time limited and inadequate in some ways, and there's anxiety about discharge. The whole point is really to look at that system of support for the person when they leave hospital and existing 
uh, family members or carers that are involved, but also giving the individual a meaningful sense that they've got active follow-up um, supports being arranged and talking about all of the relationships that they um, have or want or need in their lives, including um, to, uh, potential um, therapy options and uh, community and mental health options and, and really what's available and how to use them. And some of them um, might not seem ideal in a sense, but they're also there as uh, crisis option supports as well, like emergency departments and, and triage lines and just giving the person the sense that there are, are all sorts of things available to them and not that doors are being shut in their face or they're being rejected or abandoned, that there's a system of, of support around them and, and making the person feel that it's uh, cohesive and available for them. It's really important. Okay. Thanks, Paul. I think Anyone else? There too, then. Yeah, yeah thanks, so, Look, I think the issue to me is also um, it's a system issue for health services uh, to think about. Uh, discharging a person from hospital to a waiting list is really not acceptable. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have health services with very experienced staff who have the capacity to do rapid follow-up. Um, and um, unfortunately, sometimes health services are, have people with such long kind of caseloads that they don't have any gaps. Um, so it really comes ab about um, how do we how do we work with the staff that we do have and how can we ensure that we have opportunities for rapid follow-up clinics um, so that people are discharged to a service and get followed up within uh, one to three days. That's what we're aiming for in the Project Air Strategy um, stepped care clinics that we're setting up in New South Wales is to have that opportunity. And it's really about health services working on how they use the staff that they have to ensure that they can do both brief interventions and longer term treatments. Okay, great, thank you. So the communication, they're having ideal plans but working with what we've got, I guess, is, is an important message there, but communicating is, is a common theme that we're hearing about, people communicating and, and including the, uh, the client or the patient. Yeah. Gillian, anything to add to that? Um, I guess I it comes to raise the point about again. communication, really. But often yeah. I'd find out once the patient arrives in my in my waiting room that they've been discharged from hospital. I think things have improved a lot in the last couple of years. I don't mean to be critical of health yeah. services. I know that everyone was under a lot of pressure, mm. um, but that I think communication is absolutely essential. And just making sure that the team is working as a team, and I think we're doing much better at that. Okay, than we were right. five, ten years ago. Yeah. Yeah, good. Like, I think throughout all of these webinars, we're hearing much more hopeful messages. So obviously still work, more work to be done and more research and more um, services and funding. But I think there's a lot of hopeful messages that I've been capturing as, as we've come through all of these webinars. Now, Gillian, you've followed up on that group and you've given us the, the name of the website. So um, www.baylinkaustraliannewzealand.org slash. So that's the website. So I think we can probably share that with people as well. So right. if people are interested in that. I've also got a reminder that Spectrum have great training for GPs. So another link. And there will be resources um, that I'll talk about in a moment that, that people can, can look at as well. So our time is um, getting to the end of our question and answer time. And I, I know there's lots more that we could be talking about. But I think there's been some core messages and we've covered lots of lots of the questions that have come through. So hopefully that, that has um, given people quite a, a good idea in terms of communication ways of, of collaborating. And some of the questions will be answered in previous webinars, which you'll be able to find here. So here's the um, website for resources and further reading that people can um, pick up on and get more information about. But I would like to ask the panel, each of the panellists now, to give us a take home message. So after all the things we've been talking about and all the planning that you did for the presentations this evening, I'm going to invite you each to take a take home message that you'd like the audience to, to take away with, one of the most important things that you think you'd like them to be thinking about when they, when they finish off shortly and go and have their, their cup of tea or put the tally on. So let's start with you, Bryn. You've been jumping in first a lot. So let's start with you again. Well, you just mentioned going and having a cup of tea. So my <laughs> take home message would be to keep calm and make tea and really be thoughtful about the work, um, not, not be reactive and not jump in and panic. 
um, and to remember the difference between clinicians and patients is quite small. We can all get dysregulated. We can all become uh, emotionally um, unhinged at times. And so I guess maintaining compassion. Compassion for ourselves, that's a really important message. You've said that a few times now about us just becoming dysregulated and that reminder that we're all, we all can have this experience. So thank you for that. Important messages there. Gillian, let's hear from you now. What would be your main takeaway message for people tonight? A bit unfair following on from Bryn. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I was going to talk about compassion, but um, I just encourage all GPs out there or those of you who have colleagues who are GPs to encourage um, GPs to get out there and, and develop skills and confidence in um, delivering really effective care to individuals with CPD because it's such rewarding work. Um, and I, I, I love it. And coming from the space of being completely overwhelmed and burnt out a few years ago, um, I've learnt a lot about self-care. I encourage all of you to, to make sure that you look after yourselves first. As we used to say, we actually measured you, check your own pulse first. <laughs> um, just reflect on how, how you're feeling, how you're coping. Make sure those boundaries are in place and then you can deliver really effective care that really makes a difference for people. So, yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. And I think you've provided us with a great model tonight in terms of your story around um, that burning out risk and, and not necessarily um, you know, feeling like you're managing so well and then learning how to, how to do this better and, and promoting that message. So thank you for sharing that, that with us because I think it's been a really, a really important message. I'm a bit disappointed that the cat hasn't made another appearance so I'm not <laughs> sure whether what you've done with the cat with you booted the cat out, but the cat hasn't come I back again. I didn't, no. <laughs> <laughs> <Gentle> off. <laughs> yeah. Let's move on to you now, Paul. What would your take home message be for us? Well, I guess building on from what other people have said, it's really about being mindful and compassionate and engaged and then just really we can see there are lots of parties involved in these situations and just for everyone involved to feel that they're doing something and they're engaged so they're not being avoidant or feeling like the solution somewhere else but they've um, got something to offer and really then engaging with these kinds of issues and, and, and as Gillian was saying, forming yourself, equipping yourself and um, being willing and interested in being involved um, and knowing that everyone, if they chip in and do that, um, it, it makes an enormous difference. So that, that would be my message. Yeah, okay, fantastic. So seeing yourself as part of Part of a team rather than in Part isolation. of the solution, yeah. Yeah, yeah, not, not the only one. Okay, great, thank you. And Kerry ann let's move on to you. We began with you and now I'd like you to give us your final takeaway messages so that we're really wanting to hear from you. What do you think is the most important thing for people to take away? Very often people with BPD are po portrayed as being very sensitive um, and vulnerable people. But I want you to remember that they are amazing, resilient and strong individuals who have experienced significant distress in their lives. Um, remember in your role to do no harm. In your role, please believe wholeheartedly in the people that you support so that in time they can start to believe in themselves. Recovery takes a lot of time. Please be patient and hold space for healing and meaning making and stay on their journey with the consumer so that you can hold on to the hope for them while they cannot. Well, wow, thank you so much. And I know you, you really thought about that and um, it's something that is really powerful coming from you and really appreciate you sharing that with us and some really clear direct messages for us. And I, I think this series of webinars has really been about us, us understanding and thinking about people with borderline personality disorder in, in ways that perhaps hadn't, haven't always been the case. And I think what you just said captures that really, really beautifully. So thank you very much. I know we've lost your, your image, but I know you can, you can hear us. So thank you very much for, for that. And thank you very much for all of our panelists for joining us um, tonight and, and for all of these messages that are, that are here and are really um, important for people to take away and do the, do the work and keep doing the work and feel positive about, about the work as well. Well, there are um, practitioner network opportunities to continue this work. I think the message tonight has been don't do this work alone, that it can be challenging, that there um, are challenges that come with the work and there are ideals of what we want to do and sometimes the, the systems don't always work as well as we, 
we would like. We've also heard messages around the need for self-care and to look after ourselves. And of course, one of the ways we can do that is to connect with others and to not be alone in doing this work. So um, mhpn.org.au is a place to go and look for local practitioner networks. As we said earlier, some of them are specific to um, borderline personality disorder. Some of them are general ones in your local area. So have a look and, and reach out and, and get the support that will be obviously beneficial so that you can be do, doing this work for, for the long haul and recognising as Bryn very eloquently told us that we, we all need um, support sometimes or at managing our own um, distress as well. Now this is um, the final webinar in the series and it's important that we um, do remind everyone to um, continue to, to do this work, to um, look at the resources that are available already. So go back and, and look at the resources, the website um, that was given you before and the webinars that have been there before. There's been a number of different webinars on different topics. Some of them have been looking at the principles around borderline personality disorder and working with people and some of them have been the most current evidence-based um, treatments that we've talked about and some of the other webinars have looked at um, working specifically with young people and self-harm and, and suicide risks that we've also talked about. So a whole range of them are available for you to to look at and to go back and, and have a look at those um, and continue to, to do the work. We have a feedback survey that we'd like you to um, complete. When you do go to log out in a moment, you will see that that feedback survey will, will come up and we would like your, your feedback. As, as we said, you click with this feedback survey tab at the top of the screen to open the survey. As I said, we do report on the results and, and we do um, value your input and, and what you have to say. It can help us to continue to do the webinars that um, will be held in the future that MHBN will be doing and it obviously is provided to the funding bodies as well. Certificates of attendance for the webinar will be issued within the next four weeks and each participant will be sent a link to the online resources associated with this webinar within the next two weeks as well. So you'll get access to all of that information. So I would like to um, thank everybody that's been involved in the whole series for the webinar as well and who, people who joined us throughout this last year that we've been running these, this series. But particularly for our panellists for this evening, thank you for your input. It takes a lot of behind the scenes work and preparation to run a webinar like this. So thank you very much for your time and effort in doing that and answering some of those very difficult questions tonight. And uh, for all the people at home who are joining us as well, thank you for your ongoing um, support and, and interest in the topics as well. So before I close, I'd like to acknowledge the consumers and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. So thank you to everyone for your participation this evening and good evening. <laughs>